so in today's talk, um, I'm essentially the um, the sort of theme that links everything together is trench rollback. But um, I'm essentially looking at this from two different angles. One is from a global um, sort of geodynamics perspective and the forces on the plates on the one hand, and then sort of from a regional perspective. Um, and in fact, these are sort of uh, attempting to link two independent research projects that I'm involved in. And you sort of can see it on the first slide here where I'm listing my many collaborators. The first is um, a discussion of the global models. And you, I understand, um, have re already received uh, a copy of a paper uh, involved with um, this topic. That's the Stadler et al. paper. And um, so much of that work is work I did with Georg. He's a computational scientist at the University of Texas and myself. And then as time went on, Laura Alisic, who's uh, just graduated with her PhD at Caltech, took that project over. So some of the figures you'll be familiar with and other ones, they'll be from uh, Laura's thesis. Then um, near the end of my talk, I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to not just look at the present day geophysics, but uh, I'll also be looking at the, um, the time dependence and uh, we'll switch from uh, global to regional models. Um, but I think that the two pieces of work complement one another. So when I talk about trench rollback, I'm really referring to the cases where we have intraoceanic subduction. For example, as in the Southwest Pacific, where we have the Tonga Kermadec subducting underneath the, well, on a large scale, it's underneath, going underneath the Australian plate. Uh, and we have a little bit, uh, several microplates um, on the, um, well, so on top of the Tonga Trench, we have some microplates on there. Uh, the largest one we informally refer to as the Lao Basin Plate. So one of the things is we'll look at this process specifically, but because there are lots of observations which describe these uh, very intense deformations which occur on above the slab, there's the possibility that we can actually use these observations to constrain global models and essentially to address one of the outstanding questions which we have in the geosciences, and that is the forces which drive and resist global plate motions. So obviously this is a classic problem in our science. So the outline of my talk today is essentially to uh, first introduce you to this whole problem with some work um, from other investigators, uh, essentially what drives and resists global plate motions, and really to demonstrate that there's a need for a new generation of global flow models and um, that really start to capture the essential physics that has been missing in the past. Then I'll switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about the, um, the history of subduction in the Western Pacific and uh, give you a few details on the formation of the Izobunin Marianas subduction zone. Then I'll move into the next generation of global flow models and the prediction of plate motions and deformations. And one of the things that you'll see is that this uh, whole mode of uh, tectonic activity, back arc extension, is an emergent quantity now in the global flow models. Then we'll switch gears and look at um, this sort of trench rollback in a more of a historical sense, that is from a, a geological and evolutionary perspective. And uh, I'll point out several important things, including um, the association of trench, um, trench rollback and back arc spreading with subduction initiation. And I'll describe some of the um, dependencies that we've discovered. Um, there's, we have a recent paper on this particular um, topic, but I'll, hopefully if time permits, I'll show you some brand new models that we've done where we're looking at the evolutionary, the magmatic history of these subduction initiation events. And we've been able to match some very important observations which have been made um, in the last couple of years. So let's uh, move on and... Um, essentially look at this very classic picture which has appeared in many textbooks and review papers uh, over the decades. 
And uh, it really sort of encompasses the canonical view which geophysicists and other earth scientists have of the plate tectonic system and the driving forces for plate motions. And of course, we have the, you know, the classical uh, ridge push, and then we have uh, slabs which go into the mantle, and the slabs are in this particular plot by Forsyth and Ueda. That's the F sub SP, the slab pull force. Now, one of the things that this cartoon shows is that uh, we have essentially a tabular slab inside the mantle. And so none of this surprises you. This is our canonical view. But I'm going to show you that this is essential for understanding the dynamics, but it has been essentially missing in our in our mechanical conceptualization for global plate motions. So let me move on to that particular point and let's um, let me show you this picture. This is a, a picture from a paper by Clint Conrad and Carolina Lithgow Bertoloni um, now looks like a decade ago, but it sort of embodies um, with simple models much of our, our thinking. Um, and what the essentially what you see in this in this picture is several highly simplified models for plate motions. In the lower left-hand frame, in B, you have the observed plate motions, and you see the direction of plate motions with the arrows, and it's color-coded by the actual magnitude of the velocities themselves. So you see the Pacific plate moving at a fairly large velocity, but also normalized by the average velocity. An important point of this plot, and one of the the points of this plot is to show you that the magnitude of the subducting plates, as you probably all are aware, they move much slower than the uh, overriding plates. And this is extraordinary asymmetry um, in plate convergence. You see that between the Pacific and Asia, and you see that between the Nazca plate and um, South America. Now, if you were to put in just what is ref what um, the authors refer to as slab suction, and what they meant is the basically the long wavelength forces um, from from slabs without from the cumulative negative buoyancy from slabs, but not slabs themselves. What you get is very very symmetrical convergence. So notice how everything in that upper left hand picture is everything is in yellow, and um, it all converges towards the northwest. Pacific out there, whereas between Nazca and South America, you things, see things that are much more evenly converging towards the South American trench. Then they argue that if they, mathematically, if they attached a force directly to the edge of these subducting plates, like you get in the upper right-hand picture, which they refer to as slab pole force only, that you can start to create this asymmetry. And then if you add these two components of forces together, um, essentially you can start to reproduce what we see in terms of global plate motions. Now this in some sense just embodies our thinking and in, in some sense most of the physics in this particular model were essentially parameterized and what we would like to do is to try to embody this physics um, uh, rigorously um, in a mechanical model. So Many of the forces which we think are relevant uh, on the plates is summarized in this very, very compact equation, okay? Sorry to put up an equation, but there are really four different terms on here, and let me just quickly go through them. So in the numerator, in the upper left-hand part, what we see is the buoyancy force, okay? That's the buoyancy force from the, the temperature differences of slabs, with respect to the rest of the mantle, as well as their volume. Okay, that's what drives the plates. Then, the, in the reciprocal, in the denominator, the first term in the denominator, we have that C sub M and eta sub M. That's essentially the background mantle viscosity. So these two forces, the driving forces from buoyancy on the one hand, and then the resisting forces from the background mantle viscosity, that's the canonical view of mantle convection, without really taking into account the strength of slabs. But plate motions can also be regulated, as we see in the numerator, by um, a shear stress on the faults themselves. Those would be where the great earthquakes occur, like the, 19, the 2004 Sumatra earthquake. That's Ta sub F. But it's also resisted by the strength of the plates themselves. In fact, the, 
depending upon what the viscosity of the plates are and their thickness, they can also regulate the velocities. So what would be, we would want to do as geodynamicists is try to embody this idea of the physics into global flow models, okay, not just parameterize them. But in addition to these four forces, another important aspect that occurs within subduction zones is the fact that as the plates subduct, they dynamically weaken, okay? So this is illustrated in this particular um, slide here. So this is um, a picture. Um, it essentially uh, applies a classical technique of looking at the topography and the gravity anomalies um, along a ship track. But these ship tracks were all orientated subparallel to uh, the Kermadec Trench. Okay, and so you can see these. It's probably best if you look in the bathymetry, which is uh, one of the upper sets of profiles right to the right of the map, you see that all these ship tracks are at progressively greater depth um, along the uh, outer trench wall and the outer rise. Okay, And then there's a commensurate gravity profile as well. So for each one of these profiles, one can actually do a study to look at the correlation and the admittance between these quantities and infer the flexural parameters of the plates themselves. And what we see in the lower right-hand picture is that as you go from the four bulge, okay, so you can see in those uh, gray lettering, you see the different major morphological aspects of the trench, including the trench wall, okay, and that's usually better referred to as the outer trench wall, the four bulge, and then the incoming plate themselves. And notice how that as you progressively go from the incoming plate the, through the four bulge and then down the trench wall, that the flexural strength of the plate gets lower and lower. What I wanted to point out here is the magnitude of this signal themselves. Instead of just looking at the rigidity of the plates, and that's in the left-hand uh, scale bar, if you look on the right-hand side, and those are both logarithmic axes, as you'll notice, you'll see the effective elastic thickness of the plate, H sub E. So that's a classical quantity which geophysicists like to refer to as, and what you'll notice is that for the very, very thick Pacific plate, which normally has an elastic thickness of 50 kilometers, that its thickness at the base of the trench gets down to two kilometers. Well, those are the same values which have been measured at the axis of the East Pacific rise. In other words, there is from this experiment here, there's a no elastic strength of the plates themselves in trenches once, at least in this particular trench, once they dive down um, to the base of the trench. And this is a, as many authors over many years have pointed out, this is a process which occurs dynamically as the trench comes in and bends themselves. So this is also very important from a geodynamic perspective. So in addition to the the more static views of that I showed you in the previous pictures in terms of the strength of the plate, okay, its thickness, right, as well as its overall buoyancy and the background viscosity, we would want to have this dynamic weakening occur as well. It could well be a first-order phenomenon. Many people think it is a first-order aspect of slabs. Okay, well, how do we do that? Well, I'm not going to get to that for a few moments, and what I now want to sort of switch gears and uh, move on to looking at the, the time dependence of this system. Okay, now I might move on to a set of observations which you may not be so familiar with because they're not um, um, perhaps uh, well expressed in the literature. This is a, a picture I assembled several years ago, and what it is, it's a picture, it's color coded by what I call the age of initiation. Okay, so we've gone back into the geological record and we've gotten and determined the best estimates of when that subduction zone when that particular polarity started. Okay? So several of the classical ones that we have really very refined geochronological constraints on would be the um, Isobonin Marianas, okay, south of Japan. You can see that coming in there on about somewhere between 45 and 50 MA. 
Okay, and then you have much older ones which have been in existence for a longer period of time. They're color coded in blue, greater than 60 million years. One of the things that this picture illustrates well is that half of all of the subduction zones have initiated in the last, or they've initiated over the Cenozoic. Okay, so before this paper was published, the standard view of subductions was that it was very hard to to um, start a new subduction zones, and that subduction zones have really been around for a long time, and it's a very difficult thing to do mechanically. Well, this summary of, of, um, of our understanding would suggest otherwise, that in fact that uh, subduction zones are young and it's probably a normal continuous component of the plate tectonic cycle. Another very important observation, which is um, not well appreciated, but I believe um, of paramount importance is the association with phases of intense back arc spreading with subduction initiation. Now this is very well known for the classical example of the IBM subduction zone. Stern and Bloomer, Bob Stern at the University of Texas at Dallas, published a very well-known paper in which he argued that there was a phase of uh, intense back arc spreading following the formation of the Isobonian subduction zone. But that's not the only one. If you look at other subduction zones, including the Tonga Kermadec, although the mode of subduction initiation, there's not a consensus perspective on that particular one, but it probably initiated about the same time as the IBM, about 45 million years ago. The, the, the intense uh, rollback um, that occurred during the formation of the South Fiji Basin um, formed uh, during that phase. And for the formation of the New Hebrides subduction zone, I guess more usually called Vanuatu these days, initiated about 10 to 12 million years ago, and uh, the North Fiji Basin formed as that slab rapidly rolled back. Now, not all subduction zones have rapid trench rollback after they form. The new subduction zone south of the South Island of New Zealand, shown in red, called the Pusiker subduction zone, it also is around 12, maybe a little bit older, 12 million years ago. It does not have any rapid trench rollback associated with it. And um, recent evidence suggests that the Aleutian subduction zone probably started around 45 million years ago as well. And there was no back, intense back arc spreading associated with that. So this is really quite interesting. How, why, in some cases, do we have intense back arc spreading during subduction initiation, whereas in other cases, when we have subduction initiation, there's no back arc spreading associated with that? Well, the IBM subduction zone has been getting a lot of attention recently. Um, this is mostly driven by the fact that um, Jamstack in Japan has been um, running these submersibles they have a very deep water submersible. They've been running it up and down um, what's called the inner trench wall, um, and they've been collecting samples in situ. Okay, and so this is a great improvement over previous studies where they would essentially just scrape the outer trench wall. Pardon me, the inner trench. Well, both both trench walls, um, and uh, bring up um, up samples and not have a good um, perspective on on where the rocks actually came from from in sort of a perspective and so uh, Mark Regan at the University of Iowa with his collaborators in Japan many collaborators what they've done is they've done two very fine sections uh, one near Guam as illustrated in this picture as well as one in the Bonin arc as well and one of the things that you see here is that um, one thing that you may be uh, familiar with is that bonanites actually rapidly um, come out uh, during the formation of subduction zones, okay? And so bonanites are different from basalts. They're also an extrusive rock, but they have high magnesium and silica abundances, okay? Um, they usually have extreme depletion of some rare earth elements, but not those which are fluid mobile. So... Um, they're basically viewed as some sort of a rock which is forming um, during this initiation of subduction. And Bob Stern 
and others have championed uh, the mechanism by which these rocks are formed. Now, what Mark Regan and his collaborators have discovered, and my models won't fully um, be able to explain all of these yet, but it's really quite striking. First of all, is that bonanites are not the first rocks to come out during subduction initiation. Rather, uh, rocks which are actually quite similar to morbs first come out, although they do have a small trace element signal of subduction. And then those things are rapidly followed by bonanites. Okay? Now notice these two sections. They're 1,500 kilometers across. Okay? And actually, the whole stratigraphy in both sections is nearly identical. We have first the fabs coming out and then followed several million years later by the bonanites. Okay? So this is rather extraordinary, and this is uh, one of our targets to try to get bonanites. We actually now, you'll see, we have bonanites coming out in our subduction initiation models, although I don't believe we have a, a perfect perspective yet on how we can get rocks coming out uh, synchronously over such a wide range in, in, in a long strike. Okay, so here's just some comments on subduction initiations. So you're not likely to see these in some of the standard works on the topics. You'll see them in my papers, but maybe not everyone else's. So first is that 50% of all known subduction zones initiated since the early Cenozoics. So therefore, it must be relatively easy to form a new subduction zones since they are so young. Often, intense back arc spreading immediately follows subduction initiation. Now, um, there are mild examples of back arc spreading. I would say um, the uh, the Sea of Japan is a good example of that, or the East Sea, as the Koreans call it, is a mild example of back arc spreading that did not follow subduction initiation. Now, some, but not all, subduction initiation events are associated with the eruptions of bonanites. That's important, okay? And um, some investigators essentially associate, perfectly associate the formation of bonanites with subduction initiation. I believe that's an overinterpretation. I believe there's a spectrum of, of things that occur. And then the other thing is that we haven't yet probably been able to explain well is the synchronized, synchronous bonanite eruption over 1,500 kilometers in strike. Okay? So this is what we want to do. So that's sort of an overview of a lot of the work that's, uh, that, that's the background for the, the geodynamic models. Um, and so we really want to come up with a better understanding of the whys behind these observations. Like why, what drives plate motions? How does slab pole really work? How does back arc spreading relate to global plate motions? Is there a relationship to global plate motions? And why does subduction initiation seem to be related to back arc spreading and the formation of bonanites? Okay. So there's been a lot of work in geodynamics on these kinds of topics, but I believe that there have been severe limitations in past models of global plate motions. And let me give you a couple of cartoons. And so this is sort of alluded to in the Stadler et al. paper that you folks read, but um, it may not I have a couple of cartoons to illustrate essentially, the, um, essentially two artifacts of uh, low resolution. So this is a cartoon, and in the deeper blue, you'll see essentially, let's say, the lithosphere. Okay? This could be plates that are imposed in, uh, in models, and then you might have some weakness between the plates. Often, plates are assumed mathematically. And then deeper in the mantle, you may have a formulation of mantle flow, but because of computational restrictions, that those forces from the viscous flow are occurring over a long wavelength. Okay? So here we have a subduction zone. It has all the correct driving forces in the sense that it has the correct amount of buoyant, negative buoyancy in the slab, but because it's spread out and smoothed out over such a long wavelength, potentially over several hundred kilometers in some other recent models, whereas thousands of kilometers in past studies, one of the things you're guaranteed essentially to get is the forces are not going to be coupled into the plates in the correct way that we think as, as um, embodied in sort of that canonical view. So that's the first artifact of low resolution. The second one is the following. So here's another model. So now this is more similar to a representation that you would imagine as appropriate in the sense that we have uh, two plates 
We have a subducting plate, and then we have a slab, which is of the same thickness as the subducting plate. Now, often in a mechanical model, one can do a variety of different things to decouple the plates. Here, I just make a low viscosity weak zone. That's not the only way. It's not the only way we've done it. And there's a variety of things that people have done in the literature. But so this is what one would want to represent. You would want to have your plate coming in, bending, because bending is very important, and then have that strong, potentially strong slab coupled into the deep mantle. Unfortunately, you know, the plates are, are um, you know, 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers thick, and so that little weak zone globally is going to require very high resolution. And even if you have resolutions on the order of 10 kilometers, like you would have here, one of the things that you'll notice by that red um, polygon there is that it overlaps the, the, the plate itself, that is the subducting plate themselves. So if you wanted to generate plate tectonics from a dynamic perspective and have the rheological quantities as emergent, that is followed directly from the equations, it wouldn't happen here, right? Your resolution would overwhelm, your low resolution would overwhelm it. And so this is what other investigators can achieve right now. They can achieve resolutions of 20 kilometers or so in models. And that still is insufficient because the critical aspect of the upper plate, of the subducting plate, is still forced to be weak. And this is what essentially would have occurred, um, uh, you know, in the, in the last decade is that um, in many of the papers in the literature essentially had this. Weak zones, which are so large, that essentially none of the physics which occurs in the bending plate could really occur in it. So what's the, how do we do this? How do we get away from this? How do we create the, the kind of characteristics that we actually need in a geodynamic model? Well, one solution is this, is higher resolution models, but using a rheology which has the components of the system which both strengthen it, and that would be diffusion creep through its temperature dependence of mantle viscosity, as well as dislocation creep and plastic failure. Those aspects of the constitutive relationship tend to weaken the plate and give rise to plastic failure. Okay, But one of the things that we know from um, what, what I would refer to as generic models of subduction, okay, and, I, and my group and my collaborators do many of these kinds of models, and this is work from Magali Billen at the University of California at Davis and, and Greg Hurth, who's a rock rheologist. It's just an example. And in here, um, these are evolutionary models of subduction in which they are able to capture many important aspects, including the decoupling zone between plates as well as the weakening within the hinge zone. But as you can see up there, this requires either 500 meters to 5 kilometers resolution. This particular study, I think, used 2 kilometers, 2 to 5 kilometers. And models that I've done, which are similar to this, we went down to 500 meters. Now, you might be able to get away and use uh, existing techniques here, like shown in the next slide. This is uh, from a student of Magali Bell and Margaret Jadamak, and she used... Um, one of the codes from CIG, and she used uh, two kilometers resolution of the of the um, of the Aleutian subduction zone. Okay, but again, these would be insufficient to say, let's say, predict global plate motions, because if you want to predict global plate motions, essentially you need a global model because it's the global interconnectedness of the plates which is essential. So now we've been able to achieve these kinds of resolutions. That is about a kilometer local resolution. Um, in global flow models, and this uh, emerged from uh, a study of um, with computational scientists using new techniques um, or refined versions of what's called adaptive mesh refinement. We've actually gone down to 500 meters in some models. Okay, so um, you can find technical details on how this is done in other papers, and I won't go into any of the technical details. But the first models, essentially, which um, I want to uh, discuss are what we call instantaneous geodynamic models, okay? And so these are just sort of like one-off, one-off at one moment of time, okay? If you look at the equations which describe um, flow within the mantle, it's called the Stokes equation. It has no element of time. So we can essentially set up an instantaneous force balance, okay? 
and different aspects of this would include the uh, input buoyancy forces, mostly from the temperature field, but we want to have other structures in there, such as faults, and I put quotes around them, and essentially those would be the dipping shear zones between the subducting and the overriding plates. And then these models would be compared to a, a wide variety of observations from plate motion, surface strain rates, bunny off zone seismicity, state of stress, topography and gravity, and maybe other observations as well. And this approach is suitable for both forward and inverse properties. And the objective is really to make inferences on what the nature of the forces are like and what the mechanical properties of the mantle are. So this is just, this next slide shows you a little bit of eye candy. Um, and in this eye candy, what you'll see is um, that there's both long wavelength structures within the lower mantle. And so we've mapped in seismic tomography into temperature variations. But in addition to that, you'll see um, the age distribution within the plates themselves being mapped into the thermal structures. And, but you'll also see that, um, that the slabs are actually very, very narrow. Okay? And the reason for that is that we avoided using seismic tomography within the upper mantle and instead use what we call a tectonic sort of a regionalized approach where we use Benioff zone seismicity to define the geometry of the slabs and then built a thermal model for the slabs around them. And it's illustrated in the next slide as well. Now you all here in the audience who are looking at this uh, presentation right now will see uh, a picture in the upper right hand picture, but I, I realize that, um, that in the uh, video version it's uh, edited away. Um, but what we'll see, if you focus in first in the upper left-hand picture, this is a global sort of blow-away view of the whole planet. And this, we're looking at the mantle viscosity. And so this is uh, the viscosity which is emerges from the dynamic model. And then we have a picture in the lower part of the frame, and it's a cut through the Southwest Pacific. You can sort of see that I like the Southwest Pacific down there. We're back to the Tonga subduction zone as well as the New Hebrides subduction zone and you'll see the slabs you'll see the slabs in there as as a high viscosity blue structures reaching a viscosity up to 10 to the 24th pascal seconds then there are these dipping structures you'll see this dipping structure uh, above um, the Tonga slab and um, in the upper right hand picture which is actually in the edited version will be uh, the next slide You'll see this upper right-hand picture there, and that's a zoom in of the area around the New Hebrides subduction zone, the bending part of it. And there's two components. There's the deep red part, okay, that's the inner parts of the shear zone itself. And you can sort of see we have lots of opportunity to make this, um, uh, the resolution even higher if we want to. The resolution in this particular model is one kilometer. We've gone down to 500 meters. But then in addition to that, you'll also see that there's the light blue, the baby blue part right underneath the fault. That actually is dynamically emergent, okay? So based upon the constitutive relationship and the thermal model that we use for the Earth's interior, that weakening within the bending area is actually emergent, okay, through the dislocation creep, okay? And um, that's critical in this particular case. One of the things you'll also notice is that underneath the plates, you'll see large variations in the, um, in the strength of the plates. Well, a classical output of these uh, models would be just looking at the plate motion vectors themselves. And if we were to look at this, you're not going to get much of a different perspective here than you would get in, um, in previous studies, in the sense that uh, after we tweak the parameters a little bit, we're able to achieve um, fairly good matches to global plate motions. Now, one thing which is not guaranteed in these models is the fact that we have good plates, okay? And that's because um, how well we actually match uh, the internal structure of plates, that is, do they have a lot of deformation or not, are completely dictated by the constitutive relationship. And here, in this particular case, one of the things that you'll see is we have... Um, this quantity, which we're color coding in uh, gold there, and you'll see that uh, most of that quantity, it's called the plateness, is about one. That means there's very little strain within the Pacific plate. Whereas in the far southwestern corner, so that would be south of New Zealand down there, is 
we have very high strain rates. And one of the things that we discovered is that trying to achieve a good plate for the Pacific plate was actually quite difficult. And it did, it, it guided our early thinking on this particular um, process. Now, um, one of the things that I'm going to do here is uh, jump ahead a little bit here. Um, is this, we now return to the same slide we just looked at uh, a moment ago here in terms of plate motions, and the predicted ones are in, are in, um, are in uh, black, okay? And of course, we have the surface strain rate, okay? Um, and one of the things we can do is we can actually adjust the viscosity or the strength between the plates themselves, and you can actually control the plate motions themselves. And one of the things that we were required to do is actually make the decoupling zone between the subducting Nazca and overriding um, uh, South American plate actually somewhat higher in viscosity. Okay. So um, um, so we've already seen this in the in the previous cut through in um, for Tonga. This is a cut through in um, in uh, Peru. I believe it is. You can actually see the um, the Nazca plate is actually weak before it actually um, bends and goes into the, the trench themselves. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a um, a model, and I want to show you what happens when we add more buoyancy to the lower mantle. Okay. Now. The model, this model here, as you'll see in the upper right-hand picture, you'll see the yield stress, okay? You'll see N, and that's the stress-strain exponent is 3, okay? And then you'll see lith plus slabs. So that, those are the forces which drive it, the lithosphere plus the slabs. And one of the things I'm going to do in the next picture is I'm going to add in lower mantle structure. And normally, when we would have done this in the past, when we would have added in lower mantle structure, you're just adding in all of this extra buoyancy force, okay? But because these models now have strong slabs, or at least strong slabs are actually, you can actually compute them, okay? Um, you can actually see we're going to add all of these driving forces and watch what happens when I go from this slide to the next slide. Look at the black arrows. Watch them. They're, they're reasonable and large in the Pacific plate. And then watch what happens. Boom. Everything slows down. So basically, we've doubled the amount of negative buoyancy in this system, but everything has almost come to a grinding halt. Okay, And why this happened is because, for the first time, slabs can actually act as stress guides in these particular models. Many of the pictures which you've seen up to this point, you'd be able to find in the Stadler et al. paper. In this picture here, this is um, from a very long paper that uh, Laura Olisic has prepared. But it's an illustration of why the plates actually slow down. And what you'll see in this column of maps in the left-hand picture, you see omega, omega 0, 0 0.1, and 0 0.25. That's essentially the weighting function of of, of, of uh, adding in the, the buoyancy from the lower mantle. But when you add in the, the buoyancy from the lower mantle, you also add in lateral variations in viscosity. When you add in la lateral variations in viscosity, essentially you couple the slabs and the plates and the plates through the slabs into the lower mantle themselves. Notice in these pictures, there are these little white contours, okay? If you see them in the upper in A, you'll see white contours. Those are essentially the outline of the slabs in the transition zone, okay? And they're the same in all three pictures. Then you'll notice that the intensity of the dark blue areas increases as we go from top to bottom. That's essentially the temperature variations in the lower mantle. And what you'll notice is that all of the plates, all of the oceanic plates slow down, okay? The Pacific, notice how they slow down. You'll notice how the upper mantle slabs are basically coupled in with the lower mantle anomalies. But notice the Cocos plate. You all know the Cocos plate right there to the north of the Nazca plate. Notice how, as we play this game, 
the Nazca, the Cocos plate remains unchanged, okay? That's because it's a dangling slab in the upper mantle, and it's not coupled in with the lower mantle, okay? So what's happening here is I don't know if this is important for the mantle. You should all realize that. And during the course of this term, you probably discovered that, um, that there's a big debate between people who are arguing for strong slabs and those who are arguing for weak slabs. My argument is that from a computational perspective, we've never had the ability to actually model strong slabs before. So we've never actually had the tool to adequately address these, this, uh, these scenarios. And what's happening in these models is the following thing, okay? We have slabs here. Here's your classical view, right? And um, slabs are, are pulling down on the plates. And then in the next slide, we add in those lower mantle slabs. And notice how the arrows will get smaller in the next slide. Bingo. So basically, everything slows down in terms of slab deformations and plate motions because now the plates are partially regulated by what happens in the lower mantle. Does this occur or not? I don't know. We've, we're a little bit agnostic on this particular topic, but we do know that it's potentially of great importance. Okay. Now let's now move on to the trench rollback aspect here. And I want to show you that Trench rollback is now in emergent quantities. Once we add in all of, if we, if we sort of break the sound barrier in terms of resolution, the resolution we've always known was necessary in these models, once we put it in, we start to see the kind of tectonic activity which we know so well of in the Southwest Pacific, okay? So here again, here's a particular model, okay? And uh, one thing you'll notice is that the, the, um, in the North Fiji Basin, okay, for the little plate that's just east of the New Hebrides or Vanuatu subduction zone, you'll notice in black that there's lots of trench rollback, okay? And you'll notice that the Pacific plate, well, it's moving a little bit too slow compared to Nouvelle 1. Australia's moving fine. But you'll also notice that we're not predicting Tonga very well at all, nor the Kermadec motion, okay? Well, one thing that we recognized when we did these models is that the back arc basin was perhaps not, there was not a consistency between the age of the back arc basins and the position of the fault. So we updated that a little bit from the age grids. I know that you heard from Maria Seaton in the last several weeks, and uh, she's one of the big, we collaborate with her a lot, and she provides these age grids. But um, we needed to make some extra uh, take into account and make sure that we got a nice consistency between position of, of ridges and the age distribution to define the age distribution of the plates. And when we did that, and we're going to go from this slide, notice what happens. Just focus in on the, ta the Lao Basin and notice the, the black arrows within the Lao Basin. This is the picture I've just been showing you. If we make a little bit more realistic age distribution and conform the position of the faults with the age distribution, notice what happens. Boom. You can sort of see now we have a much larger amount of trench rollback within the Lao plate. It's moving in the correct direction. And you'll now notice that the Kermadec plate is rotating uh, in the correct way. Okay, now we actually can have trench rollback in a very realistic way, okay? And you'll see in a few slides from now what, why this is actually occurring. Um, but one of the things you'll notice is that now we have the ability to use an extra set of observations, that is the intense deformations which occur near plate boundaries to start to constrain, constrain global models. Notice how in this picture here, that N, look at all the set of parameters in the upper right-hand picture you'll notice that says n is equal to 3. What I'm going to do in the next experiment is that I'm going to increase that n by a very small amount. You should all realize that this we're now completely in the regime in terms of the stress-strain exponent that experimentalists want us to be in. So now we're going to go to the next slide for three, from 3 here to 3.25 the next slide and watch what happens to Tonga. Boom and the New Hebrides. You'll see that everything now intensely rolls back. So now we have the ability to actually put 
a from an observational perspective, constrained models where the plate is actually bending in the bending zone. Okay, this is probably a little bit too technical in the next slide, so we'll go over it. We'll slip. We'll sweep over this particular one. Um, so now um, here you'll see in a couple of different slides of why this actually occurs. Notice in the lower left-hand picture, this is a cross-section through Tonga, south of Fiji, and you'll notice how, in general, the, the, the Tonga slab is actually falling vertically in the mantle. Okay, But of course, it's at an oblique angle, right? And so the slab essentially is, is foundering, and that allows these little microplates to move towards the east, right? And so essentially, the rate at which those guys will move towards the east essentially is related to that rate at which it founders. And But how fast it founders is related to how strong that plate is, right? So down the road, we're going to have an incredible ability to constrain these observations. Now, if you go to the upper right, and that's the only one I want to mention, you'll see that the case of the Nehebrides subduction zone and look what the angles are for the flow vectors are in that particular model. Notice how those flow vectors are entirely perpendicular, okay? And this model now matches the surface kinematics. And one of the reasons why I want to show you this picture and emphasize this picture is that within textbooks and, and thousands of papers, you see flow lines associated with the kinematics of the subduction process. And you always associate the, essentially the, the, um, the stream function with the orientation and the shape of Benioff zones. Well, that is only the case if the system is in steady state. If the systems are not in steady state, like we have when we have trench rollback, we can have situations where the flow lines are perpendicular to that. Well, we've had many models by my own group and other groups around the world have shown this to be the case in what we call generic models showing the physics of subduction. But now hopefully people will come to appreciate that this is likely to be a very important process because now we have models which can also match the surface kinematics. Well one of the things that this new set of models opens up is lots and lots of observations which move into the into the observational domain. Um, so we can actually look at the uh, strain rates, we can look at the orientation um, from, of, the, uh, of the focal mechanisms and compare them to the, the principal stresses. And uh, we've done that in a variety of papers and they help to constrain these models. Um, so now I want to just quickly finish up my talk by moving on to the time dependence of subduction back arc extension, and volcanism, okay? And I've already mentioned before, I sort of motivated the talk, is that there is an association in, um, in um, from an observational perspective between initiation of subduction and intense trench rollback. So in a, a number of years ago, um, I was able to formulate a series of models with a, a several postdocs here, uh, Luke Lavier and Chad Hall. And um, essentially, we were out to confirm Bob Stern's uh, mechanical model of um, subduction initiation to see if we could reproduce it from a mechanical perspective. And the interesting thing is uh, we could, but yet it was also different in, in the following sense. Bob Stern had uh, long argued, as other investigators had argued, is that when you have a fracture zone, like you get in the upper right-hand picture with the temperature field, there's a big um, difference in uh, negative buoyancy across that. And that, if it's large enough, it would provide a force for what's called self-nucleation of subduction zones. And that would cause the, the, the older plate with more negative buoyancy to founder in the mantle and fall down and that would give rise to the intense back arc spreading, which occurred um, on the eastern side of the uh, Philippine Sea Plate. Um, now, what we discovered is that we were unable to do that unless we actually gave the models a little bit of compression. Okay, So now there's two alternative models for the formation of the Izubonin subduction zone. One is the Stern model, 
and one is the model that I've advanced, um, and we're trying to figure out ways to um, to uh, distinguish between those models. Okay, and I don't want to go into that part because I want to actually go into the volcanism aspect um, and another very important thing that we've recently discovered. But essentially, what happens is uh, right after subduction initiations. You essentially have a slab falling into the lower mantle for the first time, and it founders. And that's why you have intense back arc spreading. Okay? It's very simple from a mechanical perspective. Um, and uh, when Wei Lang, he's a new postdoc here at Caltech. Well, he's been here for a year now. And um, we, we got back onto this particular problem, and we tried to reconfirm. And initially, we thought we couldn't confirm our earlier results. He was using a much more powerful methodology. But actually, what we discovered is um, that the models were very much controlled by the um, essentially the strength of the plates themselves. And there was a whole other axis to the dynamics that we hadn't yet uh, recognized earlier. But what we've discovered, and this is a recent paper that just came out in G-Cubed, is that um, we've discovered three different modes, actually, of subduction initiation within an intra-oceanic, for an intra-oceanic subduction zone. One is uh, that middle one, which we call continuous with back arc spreading. Essentially, you have this, the same model, which I described before. But if you make the plate a little bit stronger than we had before, you can actually still get subduction initiation, but you will not get back arc spreading. Aha. Uh -huh. This could be interesting, because one of the observations I mentioned to you at the beginning of the talk is that some subduction zones are not followed by intense back arc spreading. But if you also make the plate incredibly weak, you actually go through what's called a segmented mode, right? Instead of having continuous subduction, the little slab drops off in a series of little pods, as we see in the upper hand, right-hand picture. So this is um, really quite interesting, and we've applied this to various subduction zones. Um, but, but I want to get to, you, to the bonanite um, issue. Um, because one of the things that we've done recently in collaboration with Paul Asimo, who's a petrologist here in Pasadena, um, we've um, essentially parametrized uh, different models for melting, including for the formation of normal more within a depleted mantle, as well as the melting of the different uh, depleted layers, which occur within the lower parts of the crust. And we've incorporated that into our mechanical models. Okay to see what the history of composition is during subduction initiation. And you can see a prediction here. Here's one of the cases with continuous um, subduction initiations with back arc spreading. And these white contours that you see, are both above the slab as well as within the, um, within the new little spreading center, which forms above the, above the, um, above the slab, is the amount of melting. And uh, what we've discovered is if we look at a point, well, essentially what we do is we have a whole series of points on the surface of this um, of model. And uh, what we do is we continuously monitor the composition of erupted volcanics. And for each column, they then move with the plates which are generated. And because there's a back arc, Form, the plates break and we have a new plate forming. So we follow these different plates around and then we, we can take, we almost have like a stratigraphic column for the quote, I use the word with quotes around it because um, using it in the same way that uh, Mark Regan has used it in his recent papers, the volcanic stratigraphy. Okay, well this is what we found. Here in this particular case when we have continuous subduction initiation with back arc spreading, um, here's a particular point. It's halfway between the spreading center and where the, the trench is on the overriding plate. And you can see that the composition of the rocks changes as a function of time. Okay? Essentially, we have three different um, kinds of, um, of, um, of arc rocks. Uh, one of the things that occurs is that we, we go from the bottom of the column, that's in the baby blue through green and up into yellow, essentially the magnesium number of those rocks dramatically changes from low magnesium numbers from around 70 all the way up to 76. And indeed, those rocks which are forming at the end, at the top of the column, have magnesium numbers of 76. 
and uh, and they have lots of um, um, essentially quartz, well, or at least SiO2 in them, okay? So essentially we can form bonanites at the end of the column. So first we have a series of basalts which form within, and then they quickly switch to bonanites, and they happen just over a couple of million years. And essentially what happens in these models is very similar, which happened in the original Stern and Bloomer, Bloomer conceptualization, okay? In the sense that uh, during the first phases of subduction initiation, you have lots of melting, and that lots of melting depletes the upper mantle. And then continuous subduction brings in water, and that causes the depleted mantle to melt. Okay? So that by itself is perhaps not surprising, but it's good to be able to see that we can get that in a dynamic model. Perhaps what was more significant is the fact that this process went away when we changed the mechanical parameters. And so we had this other mode of subduction initiation in which we just have um, there's no back arc basin forming, okay? So we don't have the intense rollback. And in this case, the whole bonanite eruptions turn off, okay? So perhaps this can be analogous to those subduction zones which actually don't have back arc spreading and don't have bonanite eruptions. Although I don't believe it's that simple, as you'll see in the next slide. And this is the final point I want to make, because I know I'm running out of time here. One thing that we've done is um, we've actually changed the mechanical boundary conditions on the subducting plates themselves. So these models, all of these models, have a little bit of extra force, which is added onto them. Okay, The first set of models, which I just showed you, that is the regional models for subduction initiations, we actually have this, the, the convergence being forced by a, um, a kinematic boundary condition, that is with velocity. Okay, but if we change this, okay, instead of having a kinematic boundary condition, instead we have a force boundary condition with a constant stress. What happens is we still initiate subduction, but we don't get back arc spreading and we don't get trench rollback. Okay, otherwise it's identical. That's very interesting. You can see it in this picture here where in the lower slide you can sort of see there's um, that's viscosity and the, the purplish areas of the high viscosity regions. No back arc basin forms there. So here's a cartoon, okay? And I won't apply this initially, but here's a cartoon which sort of summarizes our models. We have two cases where you have constant velocity boundary conditions in the left hand, and in the right hand we actually have a constant stress boundary condition. And one of the things that you'll notice is in the left, we have all of this negative buoyancy. We have initiation of subduction. The slab drops vertically in the mantle. But because that slab is not controlling the overall force balance of the whole plate, just of the slab itself, the slab drops vertically, and we actually get intense back arc spreading and trench rollback. Okay. Whereas if we have a different kind of a plate, which is regulated um, much more by a balance between the ridge push and the slab pull, as we have on the right-hand side, okay, uh, we have a stress boundary condition. The slab, we have an initiation of subduction, okay, but there's no trench rollback. The slab doesn't founder, okay, and... Um, the plate can actually change its velocity because you're actually adding more force as well, okay? Now, this is fascinating because this could be a new way to actually interpret um, two major subduction initiation events that we see and perhaps resolve a major dilemma that we have in Pacific geology, okay? Now, at about 50 million years ago, we have two subduction initiation events, okay? Um, you probably may have seen these reconstructions when uh, Maria Seaton uh, gave her presentation several weeks ago. And uh, at about 52 million years ago, you know, uh, between these two reconstructions, we have the formation of both the Izu Bonin Marianas and probably the Aleutian subduction zone. But the IBM system is connected to the gigantic Pacific plate, okay? So in addition to the nascent IBM slab itself will also have the Tonga slab, maybe other slabs as well, plus a very large ridge system. And that would contrast 
to what's happening for the Aleutian system, where when the Aleutian subduction zone forms, it, the only slab in that system connected to the Kula plate is going to be the Aleutian slab itself, and with a very, very small ridge segment, okay? And now the big difference from a geology and a geophysics perspective is that for the IBM, we have both intense back arc spreading and bonanite formation, and for the Aleutian, we have neither, right? And so here is our sort of hypothesis for what we call an IBM-type subduction initiation event. It's sort of right, the overall plate motion is regulated by all of the forces. Intense back arc spreading, because when that slab forms, it cannot totally dictate the overall force balance on that plate. So it founders, it rolls back, lots of bonanites. In the case of the Aleutians, don't know exactly why it formed, but it formed. It's connected to a small plate. It's connected by to the Kula plate. And when it forms, that slab pull and that ridge push adjacent to it together are going to adjust uh, the velocity of that plate. And so that plate can speed up a little bit. And because it can speed up a little bit, there's no need for trench rollback. So this is a hypothesis. It's a new hypothesis. I don't even know what people think of it. Wei Lang and I have not had any feedback yet on it from other people. But it's, a, it's an interesting one, especially as uh, the big earth scope and, um, moves off as, uh, as having the Aleutians as, as one of the um, sites uh, and margins as well. So anyways, here are my conclusions. So um, I actually think that strong slabs are an essential component of plate tectonics and, and mantle convection. But to be honest with you, uh, I realize that this is a raging debate in geodynamics, and now we actually have a tool to really actually... Um, to actually address this, because often what happens in uh, geodynamics is that um, uh, people have to make assumptions because their models are, um, are limited because of some mathematical or computational limitation, and they sort of limit themselves in the, in the full spectrum of things they can explore. Um, it could be that the lower mantle actually plays a much stronger role in, um, in controlling uh, plate motion than we've thought before. Um, we've discovered that trench rollback is now an emergent quantity of global flow models. And uh, this is going to open up the possibility of actually using the rollback rate as actually a constraint on how quickly the plates are bending and therefore how strong they are. And, um, and that ultimately will help us to refine our global flow models a lot. And um, we we now have sets of models to resolve these very important sets of observations associated with subduction initiation, including why we have intense rollback and back arc spreading following subduction initiation. We now may have a tool to look at uh, why we have bonanite formation in some cases and not in the other ones, and we've now advanced this new hypothesis to explain the differences between the IBM and um, Tonga subduction uh, between the IBM and the Aleutian uh, subduction initiation events. And um, so hopefully that was uh, all clear for you.